not this way. In March of 1983, a woman left her marriage and relationship and moved across the country with her little boy and daughter. And for the longest of time, I wondered how scary that could be to be such a young single mother traveling all the way across the country to start a new life. The dangers that could have occurred, um, the lasting effects of moving your children away. This woman was my mother um, as we left Washington State to move back to Macon, Georgia. Um, but there was a flip side to that coin, you know. What would have happened had my mother not made it back home? Had my mother disappeared or something foul took place? I was able to speak with a woman by the name of Christina Harris. And I met Christina simply scrolling down Twitter. I'm scrolling down my Twitter feed and people are telling me I need to tweet more often. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to get used to it. But um, I'm scrolling down my Twitter feed and I see someone say that their mother has been missing for 38 years. And I get so fascinated that I, I couldn't remove myself from her Twitter feed. I couldn't remove myself from sitting in this chair and just digging up all the information that I could find about this. And then I reached out to Christina. The parallels and to just know two years prior to my mom moving away with her little boy and her little girl, her mother by the name of Diane Harris moved away from Michigan to South Florida in 1981 and it was March of 1981 to be exact so I was like wow I just did a case on a little boy who in March had everything going perfect in his life and he would be deceased by June just three months later Diane Harris would go missing and I, this is what we're gonna talk about today in this video you're gonna hear from Christina you're going to hear key characters who are of interest. And hopefully we can spread enough awareness to get the police department to do their job. As we know, only pressure sometimes make them do what they should have done a long time ago. She arrived with a boyfriend by the name of Marty DeLong. And when she arrived, they moved into a motel with her two, two children and she worked two jobs. When I first realized that she lived in the motel with her two children. You know, it reminded me of this motel that's by my house. I get off at the interstate and I would imagine like, this looks like one of those motels in a Perry Mason or Alfred Hitchcock story. And um, I, I went by there actually. And I just sat, sat in my car and I looked because one of the things I wanted to do is I understand that we hear stuff and it flashes in one ear, go out the other ear, but we don't put ourselves in the other person's shoes. So I just imagine a woman coming into a new town that she's never been in before. A woman, you know, got her two young children in a motel room all day, either waiting for her with a daughter who's very close to her, or sometimes taking them to work with her. You know, it's just when you can feel and see, it makes things much more tangible to you and it show it to, it tells you something about the person's personality it tells me when i'm when i'm there and i'm looking at this it tells me you know the dedication she have to her children and it also reconfirms that this woman would never go missing all of these years not on her own will not on her own accord this is a woman who's willing to do everything she has to try to start over and create a new life for her two children. Just something to think about. <laughs> she left, um, to begin with, she went down there with her boyfriend from Michigan. Mm -hmm. And he ended up leaving. She kicked him out um, 
of the apartment we lived in because she, she worked across the, and she worked in the same parking lot at the no-name pub. And she worked one night and they came home and my brother and I woke up because we, ne- we weren't used to our mom yelling because she, she had never really yelled, not around us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we opened our door and, and saw my mom throw a beer bottle at him. Um, the reason she, I'm assuming she was, yell- she was yelling at him because he walked in after her into our apartment after her and he had a really a stalk of pot marijuana um at the time it was as tall as I was and bigger round than I was and she didn't want it in our apartment and told him to leave and she didn't want him back there and so that's what he did he left and he never came back how old were you when you last saw your mother I was 10. It was 10 years old. You you and your brother, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. One of the things I think, you know, people who watch stuff like this, and, and they don't they don't mean to do it, but you, you watch stuff like this because you're entertained into true crime. And I think when you do this enough, it sort of becomes like a television show or something where it's not real. And I want to remind people mm-hmm that this is very much real. You are very much a real person, and so is your mom. And and I think when people see them as a, see you guys as human beings instead of a story, that's what motivates and and help people, make people want to help, want to reach out, want to get into the police's ass to do their job and cover the crimes. So, what was your relationship like with your mother? I was attached to her hip. (laughs) I went everywhere she went, um, even her workplaces. She was, I was only 10, but you know, she felt like my best friend. She was my entire world. Now Diane wasn't supposed to move to Florida as she had joint custody with her ex-husband and he was supposed to receive the children every other weekend. He found out about this and he left and came all the way to Florida and tried to take the children away. And um, I remember reading that, you know, Christina was kicking and crying and she did not want to go with her father. Yes, and, and to that, you guys, you know, visibly showed you did not want to go to li- live with your father permanently that last summer. Correct. And I can, I can imagine what it would do to be so attached and just like that you think you're going for a summer but you never come back to Florida. What, what was it like? They don't have this information online. How was it told to you that, you know, she's gone and when you realize you're never going to, like, see her again? The only thing I was ever told is that the police were looking for her and that uh, my grandmother just told me they couldn't find her but they're going to keep looking and so I I kept hope you know that they would find her how long did it sit in that this isn't normal I mean like your 10 year old child you may think you know something a little bit worried but you know maybe next Friday mom was going to come up here it's going to be good when when did you like it so like a mentally set in that you, you're going to go through your life up here, going to school up here, and everything is up here from now on? Um, I suppose when I was 16, it, it started to hit me more, and I started to realize That's six she years. wasn't coming home. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it's still, even years later, in my late 20s, I, you know, I listened to a song that I hear, have heard many times over the years that reminded me of her. But then, yeah, one day I heard the same song and it just something else hit me. You know, she's really gone. And just it, it comes and goes and flashes, I guess, the fact that she's gone. And, and the thing that hurts the most is not knowing anything concrete 
I would rather I would rather know I would rather know for sure that she she was dead. So he went to court and they settled that he will receive the children for the summertime. During all of this, she starts dating someone by the name of Gary Argenzio. Gary does work for a lawyer by the name of Mitchell Dinker, and uh, he pretty much lives on his property. This lawyer, Mitchell Dinker, is said to have these wild parties on his estate where people come and have fun, drink, and do drugs. Some even saying that he was tied up into the drug trade or knew foul people in the drug trade that will constantly be around on his property. So Diane is thinking, you know, even though I'm not in the main house on this, on this property, you know, it's still a better place than what I was living before. So when my children come back from the summertime, I'll have a better place for them to live, to try to figure out things in their life. That's it. That's the story. She goes missing, but she wasn't reported missing until August 4th. And that was in Michigan. She wasn't reported missing in no name key Florida until November the 7th. I'm sorry, October the 7th. Interesting, the place where she is, where she's from, and where she knows everybody. What's even more interesting is her boyfriend, Gary, was alleged to have stolen a boat around the time of her disappearance. Let me show you the property. There's a rumor that Gary hit Diane's head on a wall. He killed her and he took her out to sea and got rid of the body. Gary, before she was reported missing, fled and left the country. And, and, and um, I want to say this as sensitive as, as I can, but the, the first story was that he, he pushed her head like to a wall in that property. And he got into a boat and a month later he left to Florida. That's the first story prior to your investigation. This is the story that Mitchell Danker, Danker. had told me. Mm -hmm. But afterwards... And Mark Rippon also told me the same thing. So both afterwards, um, I mean, nothing's changed. They, they waited until uh, 95 to say this. Um, they never went to the police in 81. Uh, they didn't go to the police when Gary Argenzio was still alive. Uh, they had never reported her missing or that there had been a crime that took place in the home. I saw another revelation that you said about there was no actual proof that he did leave 30 days after the investigation was over. There is proof that he, there is proof that he left. Um, he did not leave. The police say that he left about a week afterwards after my mom went missing. However, her actual missing date is unknown. And from guessing from the last time I saw her or talked to her over the phone, uh, he had left a month after I last spoke with her. And he had already been interviewed by the police before he left. Okay. So he did actually... They found, they found no evidence connecting him to her disappearance. What is he, does he, did he ever just say what he believed, what he thought happened? Or he just he answered, I had nothing. She had, he thought she had left uh, the Florida Keys, uh, headed to Illinois um, for her sister's wedding, is what he told the police. And it is true that uh, she was supposed to attend her sister's wedding in Illinois on August 15th. And she she had told her mother that she was going to be there. He was later apprehended and there was a trial set but for the stolen boat. But during the trial, and no one asked or no one brought up Diane ever. So if we recap everything that Christina is saying, it's pretty much simple. Either Gary has something to do with her disappearance well, what about Marty? What happened to Marty? Well, it was said that Marty left and went back to Michigan. However... <laughs> she left, um, to begin with, she went down there with her boyfriend from Michigan. Mm-hmm. And he ended up leaving. 
she kicked him out um, of the apartment we lived in because she, she worked across the, she worked in the same parking lot at the No Name Pub. And she worked one night and they came home and my brother and I woke up because we, we weren't used to our mom yelling because she, she had never really yelled, not around us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we opened our door and, and saw my mom throw a beer bottle at him. Um, the reason she, I'm assuming she was, yell, she was yelling at him because he walked in after her into our apartment after her and he had a really a stalk of pot marijuana um, at the time it was as tall as I was and bigger round than I was and she didn't want it in our apartment and told him to leave and she didn't want him back there and so that's what he did he left and he never came back he just, I he was originally over. thought that Marty came back to Michigan okay I thought he came back to Michigan, but then I actually talked to Marty. He he does live in Michigan now, and I found him and I talked to him. And he told me, no, he stayed in the Florida Keys. Mm. And so, you know, I don't know. He was he was very short with me, and so I don't know how long he stayed there. So Marty is back around in town. Could be him. But he doesn't really have a motive to. They had a short relationship. It didn't work out. He went his own way. What about the father? Did he have anything to hide? Daddy, ever in your life, was there a serious conversation with him about any of this? Because, I mean, you got to be, you got to be hectic for him if he had nothing, if he had nothing to do with it and like right at a custody dispute, right at something major happened that gives him motive. And he finally got you guys for the summer. She turns up missing. I did talk to my dad many times. Um, and, you know, there was a custody dispute. Uh, my mom was not legally supposed to take my brother and I to Florida. And my dad did show up down there at one of the schools, mm-hmm. uh, or the school we went to. and. He took us from the school without the school's permission. But then he did bring us back to our mom and we decided to wait until summer to go visit him. So, so to him, to your father, this was open and shut. Okay, I, I'm, I'm upset with you, you took him to Florida, but however, it's an agreement, I'm gonna get my girls for the summer and they both were fine. It, it was, like, there was no lingering animosity after, you know, this. I'm not sure. There may have been. But he never, like, he never mentioned. Like, was he standoffish when, you know, you have a 10-year-old girl, you know, look up to you and everything, but that 10-year-old girl turns to a teenager with questions, a young woman with questions. Like, was he open with you? Um. No, he wasn't. I didn't. I didn't really talk to him about my mom. Okay. And he didn't talk to me about her. We've talked later on in the years, way later. Um. And he did tell me he had nothing to do with her disappearance. He pretty much got everything he wanted. He got his children. They're staying with him. He was upset. He went there, and he got them for the whole entire summer. And they stayed with them until she became older and moved in with her grandmother. But this is where things get interesting. Let's fast forward to 14 years later. Let's talk about a totally separate missing person case. There's a husband by the name of Tom Stump who's married to a woman by the name of Bernadette. Remember the name Bernadette. He's about to go away on vacation on July 25th, 1995 with his two daughters, Bunny and Holly. And as he's about to go away to celebrate his daughter's birthday, at about 4.30 p.m. he stops by a gas station and he is never heard from again. Couple things. As Tom Stump goes to this, his wife tells his daughter that her husband has been thinking about divorce. 
his daughter tells her grandmother, Tom Stomp's mother. His wife calls to get a second set of keys from Hertz Rental because she said that her husband has gone to the lake to kill himself. His body is never heard from. Now Tom Stomp has a brother that he confides in and Tom Stomp tells his brother that he believes that his wife is having an affair with a prominent South Florida radio DJ. So why did I stop you guys to tell you this story? Why? What does this story have to do with Diane Harris's missing case? I'll tell you how. Because Bernadette Becker lived in the same place as Diane Harris. See, Bernadette Becker lived on that property with Mark Ripon. That was her boyfriend at the time. So slow down and really think about what this means. In one woman's lifetime, she happened to live with two people that are gone missing, vanished. Not only this, but after Tom Stump passed away, or missing, gone missing, Bill Becker moved into the location with Bernadette Becker. Bill Becker is heavily involved with the police in No Name, Florida. He has friends in the police department in No Name, Florida. And you wonder why people aren't investigating this. One woman, this is 14 years apart from 1981 to 1995, has close ties to two missing people. Not only that, but if you look at the report, they're saying five years after Tom Stomp gone missing, in 2000, they report that he's dead of suicide. There's no evidence of a suicide. The only person saying that he wanted to commit suicide was, you guessed it, Bernadette. My, my first initial thought was that her boyfriend did it also. That's what we had been told over the years. And then um, when they did the new investigation in 1995, I had come across um, a new name that the police had not told me. And when I looked his name up online, I noticed that his name was also mentioned in another missing person case. And it turns out it's the same, it was the same name. His name is Mark, Mark Rippon. Okay. And what relation did Mark Rippon have with your mom? Um, he was her roommate, and his wife, um, Bernadette uh, Rippon at the time. Okay. Did you did you know you know like um. Not not like you know they normally tell you the factual stuff like this person lived here, this person lived here. But did you know the dynamics of the relationship? Were they roommates, but like played cars or you know went out to eat and stuff or double dated? I had not heard. I had not heard anything about. Um, Mark Rippon and his his wife at the time. Um, I had only been told that uh, my mom lived with Gary Argenzio, her boyfriend, and um, they rented from an attorney, Mitchell Danker. Um, it wasn't found until later on that Mark Rippon and his wife also lived in the same house. Was Mitchell on the property or was it just the property that he owned and other people lived there? Um, I spoke with Mitchell in 1992, and he told me that he was there on the weekends. Okay. He said that he used it as his weekend party house. At the time, I was under the impression that there was only one house involved. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was listening to what Mitchell Danker told me um, about his house on Big Pine Key. Um, this is where Mark, Bernie, and Mitchell tell me that my mom went missing from. However, the original investigator told me that she went missing from a different house that Mitchell Danker also owned. Over the years, I came to believe that at some point, my mom did live in his big pine key home, and then him, or Gary Argenzio, my mom, and Mark Rippon and his wife all moved out of that house together and moved to a home on No Name Key. Okay. And the, but the no name key house, that's the house that the investigator said that he thought yes. it occurred. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. That's the home that I was told was searched after she went missing. Um, and I was told that her, her clothes were found and her pictures were found. And, and, and I'm, I want to say this as sensitive as, as I can, but the, the first story was that he he pushed her head like to a wall in that property. And he got into a boat, and a month later he left to Florida. That's the first story prior to your investigation. This is the story that Mitchell Danker, Danker. had told me. Mm-hmm. But afterwards... And Mark Rippon also told me the same thing. So both afterwards, Mitchell. Um, I mean, nothing's changed. They, they waited until uh, 95 to say this. Um, they never went to the police in 81. Uh, they didn't go to the police when Gary Argenzio was still alive. Uh, they had never reported her missing or that there had been a crime that took place in the home. Why do you think that they're not helping or they never did over the course of 38 years? I feel like there's there's things that they've done over the years that I didn't understand um, one of them was why they originally, my grandmother had wanted the 1981 case files. And they told her they would give them to her. And she was still asking for them in 1984. And she had asked many times after that, and she had never gotten an answer as to why, other than first they said that they burn up in a building in Key, in, uh, Key West. And then she was told uh, that they were shipped to Miami. And then later on, I was told that the 1981 sheriff destroyed, I was told by the sheriff in 2003 that the 81 sheriff, William Freeman, uh, intentionally destroyed all case files from 81 through 80 and up up to 84. Mm. And I have seen case files that from the Florida Keys that show those dates, some of those years, and I just don't know if I believe that, that all of the case, everyone's case files from 81 through 84 were destroyed. It's just, That's her crazy. Case wasn't, I, was, I was told they were destroyed because they were old and, and, and that they were destroyed in 1984. And I really just don't, you know, they were, they were at that time three years old. Um, so Florida has an unofficial expiration date or statute of limitation on murder, huh? And, and they, they post, you know, they have a Facebook site and a Twitter, and they post old cases mm-hmm. from back then on their websites, including the sheriff's office website. Um, and for some reason, they will not post anything about my mom's case or missing person Tom Stump's case. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't make any sense because I have asked them, I've asked them just to, if they would put just her basic details, you know, the fact that she's missing, her her height, weight, you know, and they will not do that. And I think in part it, it may be because Mark Rippon's wife at the time, Bernie Beck or Bernie Griffin, she ended up marrying a guy, she ended up marrying Tom Stump, who also went missing. And after he went missing, she married um, a radio show host, uh, Bill Becker. And this guy, Bill Becker, he does interviews. He does interviews for the police office mm-hmm. and uh, other political people in the Florida Keys. Uh, and I think that may play a part. I mean, I've been told that I don't, you know, I don't know their relationship with the police fully, but I have been told that they are friends with the police and they, and he sounds very friendly with them on his radio show. So I just, that may be a part of it, part of some of it. So what I'm trying to get through or, or, or you know, make clear is that there's no statute of limitation on murder but the files were thrown away because they were considered too old? What constitutes too old? If their files 
that a missing person or so on foul play could have happened in 1978, 1977, 1966, but during this year in 1981. And now you can't even dig on the property. I, I hate that we, we live in a world where you have to almost force police departments to do their job. I want you all to think about it. Like, look at, look at some of the cases that motivated, that, that drove me. Let, let's go back to the Amina and Sarah case. Just throw out the entire documentary that was made in The Price of Honor. Throw that out of your memory. If that never existed, this was a news story that two girls were found in a cab, murdered, shot to death. It lasted for about a week and it would have flew under the radar. It would have never been the big story. Uh, what made the police department get a whole unit and FBI together to try to solve the disappearance of Lacey Peterson. It was national news coverage. So we have Christina Harris who's sitting here and going through every single day of her life by herself without any help, just wanting closure on where is her mother and what happened to her mother. Even admitting. Yeah, I did um, turn to alcohol in my teen years and I, I drank for many years. Um, and, it, you know, I was hurting. I had hoped, I still had hopes even in my teen years you know, I, I realized she most likely wasn't coming home, but I still, you know, I still like imagined what it would be like to have her walk through the door, you know, and and I still hoped that she was alive or that I could at least find out what happened to her. You know, I, I would love to have found her remains and brought her home. Um, I had a rough childhood. I, you know, I, I missed, missed, she missed, my, my wedding, my the birth of my children, you know, all of that affected me long term, you know, but it also made me who I am today. And my main goal is giving my mom a voice and, and making people see she was a person. She was a great mother. Um, she had her issues and problems, uh, but she never neglected us. Uh, she, you know, she was very affectionate and loving and took us with her everywhere she went. Did you have any children? Yes, I did. And how many children did you have? Five. Five? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> boys and, and boys and girls. Boys and girls, I hope. I hope you didn't have five boys or five girls. <laughs> Oh wow! When, and was was she middle first or? My I, my daughter was first. Wow. So 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 how how is that? How is you know you tied to the hip to your mom and here you are and you deliver this amazing girl. I was very protective. People have called me overprotective. I'm very close with my daughter and can, my son. Can they blame you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the frustration in a lifetime. That's why I wanted to focus on what happens afterwards because that's the story that we forget in these situations. All we hear is such and such is going missing. We don't hear anything else. We don't hear what happened to the mother of such and such that went that went missing. We don't hear what happened to the child of such and such that went missing. We just hear that such and such went missing. We don't hear of the turmoil and pain that went through Christina's teenage years. We don't hear of the struggle of her going through life as a younger woman who never had that mother figure there to teach her how to be a young woman. Just the burden. Two of the strongest people, you know, I met recently in 2019 is Christina and also Jessica Boynton. They will not rest until they find out what happened in Jessica Boynton's situation, what happened um, with her attempted murder. And Christina wanted resolution of what happened with her mother. And did Tom have any family or anything or? He, just, he had a family, yes, in Ohio. Um, his mother was the one that, uh, 
worked on his case, um, along with uh, the author, the one that was writing the book mm-hmm. about Tom Stump and my mom. Um, the three of us, you know, talked together, and and a private investigator was actually hired and believed that Tom Stump knew something about my mom's disappearance and was likely murdered for it. To, to be this close, I feel like that book would have been finished. This kind of interesting story where you have an uh, ex-husband, you have a short boyfriend by Marty, by Gary, and his mysterious boat incident, leaving the country, coming back, a lawyer who's partying up with drug people and stuff around in this area, a pl- in, incompetent police department that's refusing to do their job. I feel like this would have put it on a platform to focus and cause people to look into this and make it big enough that, that we make them do their job. And that's what I want to do here to try to help her. I would love if other YouTubers covers this case. I would love if any news reporter or anybody saw this helped her and, and push this story out or investigated this for themselves. And she has her own website. I'm going to put the link to that in the description of this video and so much, so much more that is on her Twitter that I will also link here as well. I remember uh, Christina telling me how close her mother was with her mother, you know, her mother was with her grandmother and that bond that they had and how close she was with her, her mom and the bond that they have. And now, you know, Christina was able to raise a daughter in the close bond that they have. And uh, I'm very proud of her for pushing through and uh, who knows what you would do in that same situation. Let's, let's for all these generations, let's try to do what we can to bring resolution and I'll help her out. If you have any information, the detective that's working on the case, the case number and the telephone number will all be in the description of this video. And as always, don't kill, make a sandwich.